The reading is taken from John, the book of John, 13, verse 36, through to John 14, verse 14. John chapter 13 verses 36 to John 14 through to verse 14. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. There is a parable. It's not one of the biblical parables, which is called a parable. It's about six blind men. And these six blind men go into a room in which there is an elephant. They can't see the elephant, they're blind. But each of the six men go in and they stumble and grope. Eventually, they get near to the elephant. One of them falls on the floor and he says that this, this elephant is very like a wall. Another man, feeling the tusk, said, It's very like a spear. The third man goes up 
approached the animal and take, took hold of its tail, or sorry, its trunk, and said, it's a snake. Remember, these are blind men. He's just going off what they can see, can't, cannot see and touch. He can touch and that's it. The fourth one reached out with a hand and felt about the knee and said, this elephant, well, those who doesn't know it's an elephant at the time, it's very like a tree. The fifth guy goes up and touches the ear. And he says, this elephant is very like a fan. Another man goes, feeling and groping, seizes a swinging tail and said, oh, this elephant is a rope. And so the writer of this parable says, and so the men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceedingly stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, but all were wrong. There's another end to that. So oft in theologic wars, the disputants I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, to prat about an elephant that not one of them has seen. We live in a world where people grope after God. And like these six blind men, they see bits of something, but they cannot understand it. They cannot understand who God is. They are blind men leading blind men around an elephant. How different that is for the people of God. We know God. We know what God has done. We know what he's like. We can sing the words of this favourite hymn. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light. No wanting, no wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains or high soar above. Thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. And we could go on through the rest of the him, but I won't. Jim Packer, who served in Manchester for a long, many years, said, it has been said by someone that the proper study of mankind is man. He said, I won't oppose that idea. But I believe the proper study of God's elect is God. We are here to worship God. And my thinking this week as we come to, to the Sunday is simply to say to us, focus on God. Remember who he is. Remember what he is like. Because it's so easy to be taken up with other things that we do not study God. We do not study the attributes of God as much as we should. We perhaps don't study the word of God as we should. We look for the things that tickle our ears and tickle our fancies and forget that we come before a holy God. This morning I just put, put one question in before you. How do we know God? Now we claim we know God and we have vast experiences of God collectively in the church. But how do we know God? For the person who says, what is your God like? How do we know what God is like? Well, three simple things this morning, and they are relatively simple. I want us to think about how God reveals himself to us. So we'll be looking at three different passages in scripture, two short ones and one a bit longer that uh, Ian read to us. We know God in three ways, I want to suggest. We know him in creation, we know him through his word, and we know him through his son. We know Jesus by creation, 
by word and by his son. Genesis 1 begins, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, the face of the waters. God created this world and all that is in it. And if we look at this passage in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we see that the world, there was nothing. There was God. That word for God, by the way, is Elohim, it's plural. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit hovering over the ground. We have the Trinity right at the beginning of the Bible. The book of Genesis is really a book of beginnings. It's the beginning of the world, the beginning of sin, the beginning of murder, and lots of other things that we find as we go through Genesis. But I want to first of all notice that God created it all out of nothing. Think about that for a moment. God creates everything that is out of nothing. The James Webb telescope launched recently, or we've seen the pictures from them recently, uh, tell us that it go back to three few billion years after creation. So scientists tell us. But they can't tell us how he got there. They can't tell us what happened before the Big Bang, if that's how we understand it. Genesis tells the people of God that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he did so out of nothing. Many of you have been around long enough to know that that word we find here, created bara, is a word that is very important. It's only used four times in this reading in the first chapter of Genesis. But it means to bring something into existence that did not exist before. To bring out of nothing. Ex nihilo. He said, out of nothing. And I don't know about you, but I can't bring something out of nothing. I don't think any of us can. But here we see that God does. It means initiation. It means that God acted step by step in an orderly fashion to create the world in which we live. To bring it into existence. The Shorter Catechism, Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, that the work of creation is God's making. All things of nothing. By his word by the word of his power, it says, God created. What sort of God do we worship this morning? Is, are we worshipping a God of our creation, our own minds, our own intellect? Or are we worshipping the God who is revealed in his word to us? Four times, this word created is mentioned from Genesis chapter 1-1, through to chapter 2, but there are only three I want to flag up in chapter 1. The first, as I've just mentioned, is this word create. God created it out of nothing. In verse 21, chapter 1 of Genesis, he creates the sea, great sea creatures. Now, I don't know why it says in verse 21, specifically, God created them. But it's there. So I'm going to pass over that for now. A more singular importance is verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Three times here in that reading, God emphasizes that he created man and he created him in his own image and he created them male and female. Man did not exist until God, by sovereign choice, created him out of the dust of the ground. When God created him, there was nobody else there. 
It says in, in Genesis verse 7, Then the Lord formed the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. But God created him in his own image. God could have created anything, anything, couldn't he? He created the world already, the flowers and the plants and the animals, the days and the nights, the stars. But he decided to create us in his own image. And he had a particular reason for creating mankind. That was to reflect his image. One writer said we are icons of God. We are uh, images of God. Creatures made in the unique with a unique capacity to mirror and ca the character of God. Another writer puts it, we were made as intelligent and moral beings. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. We don't feel that way, do we? We're told we're just the higher level of an animal. But we have souls. We have consciences. We are different from animals. We bear some things in resemblance, but we are distinct from them. In Psalm 8, it says this, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Why? Because that's God's purpose for mankind. That was the creative purpose. We're not simply atoms brought together for a period of time and then disperse at death. We are our immortal soul that God gives to us and is eternal. God created man in his own image. And just returning again to that word bio, God created us out of nothing. Just consider the creative people among us. Um, if you're a painter, a sculptor, or a whatever. You can't work from nothing. You need to have something. You create because God created something. And you create because God created you a creative being. We are made in the images of God. And we create out of his creation. For his glory and purpose. And notice Though we didn't read the whole of Genesis 1, repeatedly God says, he looks at his creation and he says what? It was good. Verses are these. Verse 4, and God saw the light and it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Verse 10, God called the dry land, earth, and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 12 says, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 18, God created man to rule over the day. Oh, sorry, he made it to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the lights from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Speaking of the planets. Verse 21, God created the great sea creature. I mentioned that a moment ago. Every living creature that moves and which with waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And you go on and on to the, big, to the book of Genesis, the first chapter. God saw it was good. But does it strike you that that word good seems a bit weak? When I come past Mount Carmel, there's a sign outside the church. Ofsted considered Mount Carmel to be a good school. Not excellent, not outstanding, just good. And is that all that this word seems to imply? They looked and they thought it was good. Well, there's many different ways you have to understand this word. But it's more to do with God took delight in what he created. It means good, delightful of being pure, of bringing joy to God as he looked in his creation. He looked at it and he said, you know, this, 
world that I created is good. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's amazing. But what's the problem? We look at the world now, and it isn't that way, is it? We look at the world now, and we see that it's broken. We look at our lives and see that they're broken. All of us look at aspects of our lives, and we see that it, those lives are broken in some way. Different ways for different people, different experiences. But we have all become subject to the fall. God created everything good. Man rebelled, and the world fell. And not only did it take man with it when God brought judgment upon mankind, he took the universe with it as well. Paul says this, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So when Paul writes this, he looks back on a, on a world that is groaning. It's in pain. It's in agony of birth. Yet he has not despaired that God is there. He just sees the world as it is. It's a world that is in tension. It's diseased because of sin. Paul writes again in Romans chapter 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them, that is the fallen man, because God has shown it to them, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. The blind men walk up to the elephant, or crawl up to the elephant, and come up with their own ideas of what this object is. In a similar way, fallen man does the same with God. He gropes about in the darkness and comes up with ideas about what God is like, never knowing God, because he never actually comes to know God through the ways and means that God has designed. He tries to do it through his own intelligence, his own imaginations. And if we look at history, Look at the ancient cultures around the world. What are their gods like? Just think about it for a moment. Their gods are not like the God that we know of the Bible. They are not like this God. But Paul says that there is this in us that does not want to believe in God. We see creation. We see God's stamp on the world around us. If you go to a park or you go to a zoo or you go anywhere in the world and you look at creation, look at the natural world around us, you see how it's designed, you see how things function and you understand it. In generations past, <coughs> scientists would want to look at the universe. They want to see the hand of God in it. Today we reject the hand of God and look for something else. And as I say, we're like blind men. <coughs> oh, God, you've got a microphone, is it? <coughs> Creation is broken. We reject God. And as Paul again says, we exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like men. That's what history teaches us. Many years ago, we went into Pompeii, went into one of, one of the houses that had been excavated, and there on the side was a small niche where the Roman gods would be. And when the person came into the house, they would give, bring an offering to the god. Creation is fallen. It's damaged. It's broken. Yet it is still the world that God created. Not in its perfection, in its fallenness, but it is still God's world. We are still God's people. He is still our creator, whether we acknowledge that or not today. We are called to worship the living, true God. 
C.K. Chesterton wrote, When we cease to worship the true God, it's not that we worship nothing, it's that we worship anything. And in our world today, the world is full of worshippers. Or well, not. We may not be worshipping idols of statues of wood or whatever. At least not here. Not everywhere. But we have our own idols in our culture. The things that we bow down to and worship, we can't live without. We've got to have this and we've got to have that. So how do we know God? In creation. The second point is very brief because I talked on it a few months ago. We know him through his word. The word of God is God's self-revelation to us. It's not man groping around. It's not like there's six men groping around in the dark and coming up with an idea of what God is like. Because again, we can look at history and we see how that has panned out. What it is, the Bible is God's revelation of himself. How do we know anything about God? Through his word. He makes it known to us what he is like. Matthew Barrett in his book on the, on the uh, uh, book on grace alone, word alone, says we do not find God. God must find us and reveal himself to us. Is that true of each of us? Did we go looking for God or did God come looking for us? God ultimately came looking for us. Jesus said what? I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. The initiative of redemption, the initiative of the gospel is rooted absolutely, totally, 100% in God. Because man left to his own devices never comes up with God like this. Come up with a God of works, bow down, bring, do, but of God of grace of mercy. Didn't do that. We know God because he revealed himself to us. And he did so by his word. Timothy says, All scripture is God breathing, is useful for touching, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The word of God, in its entirety, is God breathed. It is not the invention of man. I remember, I think Mark Dever was talking to a, a Catholic priest in Philadelphia one time. And the Catholic priest was saying that the church created the Bible. Mark Dever stopped the priest and said, no it didn't, the Bible created the church. What do we know about God? What do we know about his character? What do we know about the plan of redemption? What do we know about anything to do with God? From his word. So why should we neglect the reading of his word? Which we can do. It is through the word that we know God. It is through the word that we understand what he is like. It is through the word that we understand the promise that we find in Genesis 3.15. That I will put my enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your hand, your head, and you will strike his feet. What do we make of that? Until we understand this is about the promise of the gospel. That Satan will be defeated, Christ will be victorious, and he will redeem a people for himself. We will not get to the gospel by our own imaginations. We will not get to knowing God, who truly is, what he is like in our own imaginations. We know it because God reveals himself to us. And when we hear the gospel for the first time, and our ears are opened, and we suddenly hear what we had never heard before, life changes, doesn't it? We hear the word of God in a sense for the first time. Yes, we've been in church. Yes, we've heard the preacher. In my case, ramble on a bit. But there we are, we have the preacher. And he's told us this time after time after time that these words have gone over our heads. But this day, 
they come home, we hear and we believe and we see the gospel is about. Final point, rather briefly, is his son. How do we know God? We know him through Jesus. That's why we had our reading. He's taking place towards the end of his life, his earthly life. He's heading towards the cross. The disciples are gathered around him. Peter has said, I'll follow you anywhere. And then betrays him later. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Because Jesus has been saying, I'm going to leave. How can we come? We don't know the way. But let's focus on Philip, he said. Philip in chapter 14, verse 8 says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me? Philip, even after all I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? What is Jesus saying here? There's a lot more in this chapter, a lot more in this, this section. But I want to focus on that. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Philip says, show me the Father. And I'm sure that some people will say, look, if, if Jesus is real, let him stand in front of me. But Jesus stands in front of people when the Christian comes and shares the gospel. When that person sees Jesus for the first time, he knows the answer to those questions. He's no longer a blind man groping around an elephant in the unknown. He finds and understands what being a Christian really is. Jesus with his, with his disciples in the upper room is preparing to leave and he will soon go to the cross. And it's in this reading that we have that famous verse, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man comes to me except through me, to the Father, except through me. So God reveals himself in creation. God reveals himself in his word. And ultimately, God reveals himself in himself, in Jesus. Jesus is fully God and fully man. God could not save us unless he dealt with sin. We cannot deal with our sin. So God came in the form of Jesus to take our sin upon himself. But you will notice here just three brief points. Jesus points to the evidence of him being the f with the Father and the, he and the Father are one. He speaks to his words. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was God. The very words that Jesus spoke here, the very words that Jesus spoke throughout his entire ministry were like as God speaking. There was no distinction in the Trinity. God the Father was speaking through the Son. Hebrews tells us that in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets in many times and various ways. But in his last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus is the last word. There is no other. Jesus is the one who has come to save us. Yes, there have been prophets with Moses, Ezekiel, Daniel, all that list in the Old Testament. They all could not do what Jesus did. He lived a perfect life and died for the sins of his people. So when you think about his word, think about his teachings. They are the same as the very, very voice of God speaking. And his works. You can list over 40 miracles, depending on which book you pick up. Just think of, think of a few. In your quiet mind, just think of those miracles. Water into wine? 
walking on water, feeding the 5,000, still in the storm, healing the leper, raising Lazarus, raising a few other people. When Jesus was on the earth, he showed God in himself. And no wonder he, he, he's somewhat amazed at Philip's question. He says, look, you've seen me. Don't you know who I am? I've been with you for three years. I've been teaching you daily. And you've been seeing the miracles that I perform. And you still don't know. I think the point was here, they knew it, something of Jesus, but they didn't know all. Because the cross hadn't happened yet. The resurrection hadn't happened yet. That was still coming. And within days, they would know who Jesus really was. And in closing, I just want to uh, make two points and then we're finished. It is not enough to know about Jesus. It is not enough to know about God. It is imperative for your eternal soul to know God. To know God. Not simply have an intellectual assent to the things of Christianity. We need to turn to God in repentance and faith and ask God to give us new life in Christ. Which he will do if we come seeking that. Christ died for sinners. You can come into the church and be a very good person, but if you don't acknowledge your sin, you haven't done business with God. We come confessing our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? That's the promise that He has made to us. So let's finish. Six blind men. Six blind men go into a room. They grope around in the darkness. They all come to different conclusions, none of them true. The challenge this morning is to say, what do we know about God? Obviously you can't deal with everything, all the permutations and various paths we could go down in answering these three questions. But we see God revealed in creation, in his word, and ultimately in his son. Are we going to grow up around like blind men around an elephant? Or are we going to come and ask God to open our hearts and our minds and our sight to see the reality of the risen Christ? Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you now, we, we pray that you would take your word, not my portion of words, but your words, Lord, and use them for your glory in the midst of your people. Make us hungry for your word, but more than that, make us hungry for you, Lord, that may desire you above all things. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.